Good afternoon. Thank you guys for joining us. My name is Chris Gonzalez. I'll be your host this afternoon. We're broadcasting live from San Marcos, Texas. This is Something Social. Today we're talking and interviewing with Mr. John Andrews. John Andrews is a lifetime media disruptor and marketer, successful entrepreneur, has founded several successful marketing campaigns like Walmart's 11 Moms, as well as been featured in VentureBeat to Forbes the Ad Age. John, it's a pleasure to have you in the studio. How are you doing this thank afternoon? You. Thank you, thank you. Good, good. How about you? Doing well, doing well. Great. John, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're really excited to have you in the studio and on today's show. Um, for our audience that's not familiar about your background, can you tell us a little bit more about how you got started? And um, we're really interested to hear more about your 11 Moms campaign. You know, I know you actually created that, and that was a huge home run for you guys and you and Walmart. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, I had been a marketer for about 10 years prior to joining Walmart in a, in a classic consumer packaged goods marketing role, um, what I went to school to do, what I, what I was trained to do. And, you know, um, as we were kind of discussing before the show, you know, when you got out of school as a marketer in 97, you, you know, you made, you made TV ads, you made print ads, you did some, you know, promotional stuff, you know, coupons or, or direct mail or whatever. And that was pretty much it, you know, it was a, it was a pretty much tried, uh, you know, tried and tested models and, and that's what people did. And when I went to Walmart initially, I was on the, the grocery marketing team and, and basically those were our, our main vehicles, you know, and we were, we were beginning to, you know, just get into digital and just get, you know, social had just come up. I think what, Facebook is, is just now coming live. Twitter is just now coming live, you know, so people don't even know what, you know, who, who knows what you do with that. Right. But, but, um, uh, you know, we we began to take a look at that, and uh, I joined a um, and helped found a, a team uh, called the Emerging Media Team. And and I, I said, you know, as I got that opportunity, I was like, wow, that's great. Um, what is emerging media? You know, uh, that, that you know, that's uh, I'm I'm all in, but let's figure out what it is. And it was really defined at that time as kind of everything beyond the banner ad. So, you know, it was social and mobile and local. And, you know, there were all of these things, like a lot of companies, there were all of these things going on all over the company. You know, uh, the, the HR folks were dabbling on Facebook a little bit because they realized, you know, it was a great place to recruit people. You know, this was 2007. This is, you know, pretty, that's pretty early thinking at, at that point. You know, folks were, were doing some, some minor projects with mobile and, and, and just, you know, really starting to, you know, text and thinking about what, what these things mean. And, 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 you know, it was pretty obvious that consumers were going to go there, so you had to figure out a way to reach them. Um, so 11 Moms really came out of a, a lot of my exploration into the space. And it, as I began to do just things like, you know, simple Google searches of um, low prices or um, lowest prices on groceries or, you know, things that, that people may, may Google, things that people might search. I began to find a lot of content that was created by um, people, you know, not not organizations, not brands, not you know, but but people. And, and as we began to look closer, a lot of this content was really good, and it, it had, um, it, you know, it it, it had a, a, a lot of audience. It, it had a lot of interaction. It had a lot of things. If you, you, if you think about saving money, there were all kinds of people producing content about. It, you know, couponing and frugal living and smart and efficient living and all these, you know, all these different kind of genres. So we began to, to reach out to some of them and, and have conversations and really understand, you know, this is a learning process. Why are you doing this? What, 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 what makes you create this? And, you know, we began to find out that, one, a lot of people got, got into, you know, this content creation because it was a way for them to communicate with their friends and neighbors and other people. And as they began to, to produce content, you know, people began to consume their content, you know. And so it was all of a sudden they had an audience and people were saying, well, hey, you know, how do I, how do I create a holiday meal that's, that's uh, you know, on a, on a budget or, or, you know, what, whatever. So, so we began to, to look from the, the, the perspective of, gosh, you know, this is a media form. How could Walmart, as a uh, as a, a, a company whose brand stands for saving money, uh, foster the creation of more content like this? And that was really our initial premise, right? And, and so, you know, we we really engaged these folks to help us learn, 
and, and to help us, you know, figure out how we navigate in this space. And, you know, I remember clearly one of the first projects we ever did was with the um, the launch of the iPhone. You know, so you think about the, you know, for the first, I don't know, year, year and a half, um, the, the iPhone was not sold at Walmart. You know, it was sold at Apple, sold at different places. But, but you know, it was, was really clear to Apple that Walmart's probably a good customer base for this product. Um, I think at that time, Walmart was actually um, uh, probably selling as many iP uh, um, iPods, do you remember that product, as, as, as Apple was, right? Because guess, guess what? You know, half, half, the, half the country uh, goes through the doors of Walmart every week. So there's a great customer base. So... When they launched the the the, the iPhone at, at Walmart, we were talking about different ways we could we could market the product, and and one became this this group of of bloggers, and they were mom bloggers that, that at that time that we had assembled, and and we began to again have a conversation with them about what the iPhone could mean. Uh, for saving money, you know, it's kind of you know, maybe counterintuitive to think about, uh, you know, at that time I think I had like a $600 phone as a as a frugal purchase, and and, and actually a lot of the 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 the, um, the people who were involved in the program were having that conversation, and then began to have really um, kind of helpful conversations about well. I could use the iPhone to get gas buddy, so I could, you know, get the lowest gas in in my neighborhood. Or I, I could use it for for couponing. The, you know, there were couponing apps and things that had started to appear. On, you know, so there were ways that you could use this device to save money, to save time, and it fit into the narratives of the of the stories that these folks were creating. So I was like, great, you know. So so and some of these stories actually still exist if you Google. Um, you know, Walmart and iPhone and 11 Mom. You could probably, you know, some some of these are still part of the narrative that 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 was that. I mean, you know, it's a, kind of the great thing about digital content; it kind of lives forever. Or the bad thing, if it's not not good content, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but you know, what was what was really interesting about that is how um, as as these folks began to create these stories in in ways that were relevant to their audience. They were able to integrate the other parts, so so content from Apple about how the phone works, and content from Walmart about you know what they're selling the phone for, and where the phone is available, and all of this stuff began to get aggregated into this kind of hub content, the story, the blog post, or whatever, and then be syndicated across you know at at the time you know Facebook and Twitter and and other channels that exist. And if you look at that today, that's essentially how the 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 space still works. Much more complicated, much many more players today. But that idea of hey, there there's a content creator with some type of audience that can that can connect to other people is still a, I think a core kind of a content marketing model that that works. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, great points, great points. You know, and I like the idea of um, how you were working with a lot of content creators to come up with that during the 11 Moms campaign. But, you know, um, as we've seen the, the really influencer marketing involved, one of the biggest pain points for a lot of brands is that they don't really want to give up creative control to a content creator. Can you talk about some of the ways you've kind of overcome that and, and the way you've actually encountered that and some of the work that you've done, um, especially with that more client-side marketing? Yeah, man, that's a great question. Um, you know, because as a marketer, the you know you're spending all your time thinking about how do I craft my brand, how do I, how do I, how do I manage what's said about my brand and and, and what I want people to understand about the benefits of my brand or, or all of those things. You know, you you go to school to learn how to control your brand, and now exactly it's like you know people break out in hives. It's like what, what? Uh, you know other consumers, but but the reality was. People had always been saying whatever they wanted about brands. There just wasn't this, this uh, it, you know, this everlasting broadcast, uh, you know, device that that now somebody said something publicly. And you know, it was it was an interesting time because you know, I think a lot of marketers were like, oh my God, somebody doesn't like my brand. Well, guess what? Not, not everybody likes your brand. You know, um, I'm a, I'm an Apple um, uh, fanboy. Uh, you, you know, self self confessed. 
but but uh, it, it, you know there are times that I get frustrated with Apple. You know my uh, you know my my phone freezes up or something. I'm like, what? You know it's not supposed to do that. But I'm an Apple fan, but that doesn't mean I never have anything negative to say about it uh, about Apple. And I, I think you know it, 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 as consumers began to get a voice, you know through through ratings and reviews, through you, you know that this public voice, it, it was a really interesting time for brands. And you know. Um, as as I began to talk to other brands and other marketers and, and and stuff about this, I'm like, look, people are going to say what they want to about my brand, right? My job is to interact with them if there are negative things that are said or 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 or, uh, or, or negative things that are going on about my brand to be part of that conversation because because guess what, you know. Um, if you don't like my brand because it doesn't perform well, that's probably something I can do something about as a marketer, mm -hmm. right? So, so that uh, you know the the value uh, of connecting with a real critic, not a hater. Haters are going as, as my good friend Ted Rubin says, haters are going to hate, right? <laughs> and, and there's nothing you can do about that. And what I think, what I what I like about that is I think most people have gotten comfortable with that. They're just people who hate and they hate and you can kind of see people who hate, you know, kind of hate across the board and people tend to tune them out. And Great point. I mean, we were talking about some of the challenges of getting up creative control and I think um, I read a really good um, quote in an article that was basically said, look, if your brand's on social and you've already given them the means and medium, you've already given up control because people are going to go on there and say, you know, what they're going to say. And I think that's really true of uh, Twitter kind of transitioning to some of their help desk type stuff that they're playing around with because I know Twitter's um, kind of going through a lot right now. But, well, uh, that, and that, that transparency I think is a big deal. I mean, you, you, you've seen brands and you've read the stories about brands that have, have uh, it, it, you know, really tried to control negativity or negative comments or, or, or things and it, it always goes bad. You know, transparency is great. Um, you know, having the uh, ha having an interactive conversation with consumers, what this this media medium is all about, right? Mm -hmm. And it, you know, and 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 I'll say to brands all the time, gosh, you, you know, it really always hurts me when I I see a brand that is broadcasting, you know, uh, across social channels, but then not answering people, not interacting with people. You know, I, I think most consumers have a, a reasonable expectation that if if I speak to a brand on social channels, uh, they're going to speak back to me. Mm -hmm. it, you know, or, or at least there's some customer service activity uh, that a queue that I'm going to get put into. But it, you know, you you really shouldn't be a brand on social channels if you're not ready to to interact with folks. Uh, because it, it, it's really the the benefits of, of the channel. If you want if you want to advertise, then just advertise. You know, it's very. <laughs> or if you want to do PR, just do PR. It's much more efficient than social. Social takes you know, it takes a heavy lifting. It takes work, and, and it's it's something that uh, it's a strong consideration you know before you go into into those kind of things. You know, and that's a great point. And I want to transition. I mean, you helped fund uh, start and a uh, company called Collective Bias. And they're really um, a, a blogger and content marketing um, company it's focused more on the retail industry. But I thought one of the things that was really interesting is, you know, back in 2013, you're really more focused on building a community around something. I mean, what were some of the efforts that you did when you were working on that? And I guess what are some of the efforts in general that you found really effective to building and cultivating a community around a brand just to get started? Because I know you, stop, you sat in stealth mode for six months and just listened um, is, is what I think I read. Yeah, and that's the that's the model from Eleven Moms that I think was really really important was um, really connecting with people in any community that you're in to learn about the space where where you're participating. So um, I'll give you give you a great example. I'm working with um, uh, uh, my old company uh, actually now the the company uh, that I worked for uh, prior to joining uh, Walmart, uh, a company called M Plus, and M Plus is a uh, one of the largest uh, manufacturers uh, of, uh, of footwear accessories in, in the in the world, right? So um, the the company owns about 15 brands today that um, are are primarily you know anything below the ankle except for socks. So <laughs> insoles, uh, shoe care, shoelaces, you know what you would consider to be really exciting stuff, right? 
Um, but but the reality is, it is very exciting stuff for the people who use it. So if you look at runners, right? Runners are a, are a really tight knit community, right? Runners learn from each other. They learn training. They learn ways to do things. Uh, we have a brand called Yak Tracks, which is an outdoor brand it's for people who like to be active outdoors or, or you know, be able to walk on snow and ice as an ice traction device. You know, very very passionate communities about people who want to be outside. We're we're entering right now um, the the sneakerhead market, right? And I, I know you can look at me and obviously tell that I'm a huge sneakerhead, right? Um, not a market that I know a ton about, right? Uh, but I love sneakers. And, and again, just like with the 11 Moms community, um, the, the, the community is very, very, very active on so, social channels. So if you go to Google or you go to Twitter or you go to Instagram or Pinterest or whatever, and, and you type in sneakerhead or hashtag sneakerhead, um, you're going to instantly be plugged into that community. And what you're going to find is the community is, is very obsessed with talking about new releases, the subtleties of shoes, how to take care of shoes, which is a conversation that we want to be in since we, we, produce, uh, we produce a product, uh, Force Field, that helps, helps uh, sneakerheads protect their shoes. Um, you, you know, so, so again, I think if you go back to that idea of start with listening, start with getting involved, start with asking questions, um, go and read and consume the content of the community and understand how the community talks about things and, 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 and connects and, you know, some of the subtleties of the languages. I think it's a great use of social media. Actually, as a, as a marketer, you could do nothing but that and probably be very successful at social media. I, 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 I really believe that. You know that's so true, and I think a company that does that really well is uh, it's called Crowdtap, and they actually are bringing the, the uh, consumer into a lot of the questioning as about different products and services, as well as bringing them into the creation of uh, the of the actual product um, themselves. And I think you know Lay's did that really well when they brought them in to create the different flavors of potato chips. You know, you got coffee flavor and all these random flavors that were created by the customers themselves. Um, I think you're doing some of that with what you're working on with the Sneakerhead project. You actually were telling, I guess we had, uh, from what we had spoke out before um, off the show, you actually were talking with uh, sneaker influencers and people that were really heavy in the sneaker community to kind of get their thoughts on what, uh, what, their, what the industry was like and to hear them out as part of that listening element. Yeah, not not only that, um, I actually went into the physical world with them. So, you know, we've, we've had a couple events now in New York City where, where we've gotten together with sneakerheads, actually, um, and, and really understanding um, how they interact with the environment. So we, you know, we've gone to some boutique retail, a great retailer in um, in New York uh, called Extra Butter. That's uh, it, you know a, a really, really, a, it, it's a you know in this space in every city, uh, you know d down in down in Austin, up in Boston, you know out out in L.A. There are two or three or four or five, you know, whatever, depending on the size of the city, um, boutique sneaker retailers, right? And these are the folks that are driving the front edge of the of the the trends, right? And wow. and and, uh, and and really affect what happens at the you know the foot lockers and the finish lines and the 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 sports authorities, right? The the more mainstream kind of kind of stores, and and what, so what's interesting is going and and really connecting with those influencers, understanding how um, the, the, the retail, especially that boot, boutique retail, is part of the cultural center uh, of, this, of this community was really important. And I, I just don't think that's something you can get you know, from a trend report or from something else. It's, it's you know, getting your hands dirty as a marketer, which, which I think is great. And, we knew these people because we had connected with them via social channels, via you know, via um, uh, you know, following them on Instagram and 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 getting to know them and commenting and and you know, sharing with them, um, and then sharing our, our our product. So so we um, it, you know, the product's not on the shelf yet. It won't it won't launch until late November. But we had. Um, developmental product that we were putting in these folks hands to help us with formulations does this product work like 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 we've we've um, designed it to um, is it uh, you know is it, are, are our instructions correct you know all of this the subtlety that we used to 
to you know to really drive as the marketers now using the market to help us do that is is, is I think really part of the power of the the space and you and you're right the 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 folks like CrowdTap who you know I can remember you know, you know again way back in my dinosaur days of my career um, you know these big heavy lifting focus groups and you know we'd go to a city for four or five days and we'd sit in these rooms and we'd eat eight pounds of M and M's and popcorn and shit and watch you know watch <laughs> these people yeah you know and now you can go to CrowdTap or or even better I can just go to, to Twitter, or I can go to Instagram and see what see what people are saying, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's it's such a it, and then I can have conversations with them, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and it's amazing what happens when you ask someone who has a passion about, you know, cars or clothes or or cosmetics or whatever about mm -hmm. their passion. They want to talk to you about it, you know. They 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 want to tell you about it. Yeah, and I think even on the lower end, uh, maybe in more in the SMB or smaller budget marketing sectors, even if you can't, you know, you, we see social really replacing that focus group. I mean, even if you can't um, put put all the money in to go and do this diligence and find these people and run a full focus group, how about just QA testing interest and behaviors from Facebook ads, you know? Sure. 300 sure. bucks, where am I getting the highest conversions with what types of yep. behaviors to understand your customer better? Yeah, I, I think that's really uh, that's really what's exciting right now, and and um, especially with with what Facebook and Instagram and and some of the other platforms are doing with really really precise targeting. Um, it, you know, I saw um, uh, a, a great article today talking about how Facebook is just very quietly rolling out new targeting features. So the ability to target this and that, or this. Uh, and exclude terms, right? So I can, I can just really focus. I mean, if I wanted to go focus on sneakerheads and Facebook, um, really, really easy to target that group. And your point, uh, for me to, to test different kinds of content, different kinds of creative, different types of messaging to see what works to get to a much more efficient place um, and not spamming the shit out of everybody that doesn't care, you know, which is, which is great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're going to we got about five minutes left on the show. I think those are some excellent points, and I want to jump off that point and really kind of touch on, on um, you know, you like to talk about pirates a lot, and you like to talk <laughs> about these disruptors um, and these people that uh, and companies themselves uh, that are really changing the world and changing the game. How do you think the ad world is changing? Where do you see it going? And do you have a few pirates in mind that are really changing it up in 2015, and what's your perspective for the three-year run? Yeah, you know, it's it, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I think as uh, companies like Uber and Airbnb and, and some other folks have just come in, and, I mean, you know, that's disruption on a, you know, a, a, a gargantuan scale. Um, a lot of companies have gotten pretty savvy about disrupting themselves, right, because they're like, look, either we're going to do it or somebody else is going to do it for us. I think there's a, there's a quote that, uh, you, know, you know, either disrupt yourself or somebody else will do it for you. Um, you know, and you, you look at companies, so you, you think about, uh, about categories that are just going to get thrashed, right? So uh, financial services is one of them. So you think about a guy like Greg Weiss at, uh, at MasterCard, you know, and you look at what MasterCard's doing to really enable payments on, on at, at any kind of, you know, from any device, from, in any, you know, to really bring simplicity to the, the payment uh, space, you know, it, it's fantastic. And, and again, um, you, you know, it goes back to what does a consumer want to do? You know, what are they interested in? What do, what, what do they, they want to create? So, you know, I, I, I think about MasterCard, it's a huge company in the payment space, you know. They are actively thinking about, okay, so Apple Pay is a thing. How do we work with that? But we might have our own system, and we might have uh, uh, text-to-pay, whatever, right? Let me, let me give the consumer choices. It's just like with media today. Let me give the consumer choices to consume like they want to. You know, think what, think what ESPN. So ESPN is this gargantuan company in sports, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they every day are thinking about how to make it easier for me to consume, you know, the content I want to about sports, right? I, most people know me know I love Duke basketball. Uh, I love anything to do with Duke. I'm going to eat up with it. You know, all I want to do is consume Duke information. So make it just easy for me to get that from my, you know, from my watch to my, my phone to my TV to, to a printed vehicle if I want to read ESPN the magazine. It doesn't matter, 
right? ESPN's doing all of that. So, you know, and they need to do that before, you know, the Bleacher Report or somebody else dis- disrupts them, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and, and they have to go out and spend a bunch of money to buy them, which I think they did. Uh, you know, so, uh, I, you know, I think those are, those are some, some good examples. And, you, you know, you can, you can think about more and more, you know, I, I love the retail space, been in the retail space, you know, a lot of my life. I think it is absolutely a place that's just going through through massive disruption today, mainly because consumer behavior is changing. You know, we don't necessarily want to shop in a store anymore, right? And, and I think if you talk to anybody below the age of like 25, if I tell my daughter, where she's nine, so it may not be the greatest example, but the idea of going to the mall or to a store or something else to her is is, is like torture. She, she's like, I, I she, why would we do that? We can just order it online, you know. Yeah. And she's right, you know. And and, yeah. and it's going to increasingly be easier for for her and for me and 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 her mom to do that, you know. So so it's it's interesting to think about. Wow, yeah, great point, huge point, especially how retail is changing. And uh, I got we got about one minute here before we wrap it up, but I want to leave the audience with one idea and uh, one final question for you. Um, with so many options and so many great ideas and so many opportunities going right now in the market, I mean, uh, I know you've struggled with this probably yourself. How do you find that entrepreneurs narrow their focus and just pick one um, when you're looking at so many different opportunities and so many ways to spend your time and what's been really worked, what's worked well for you? Yeah, it's really hard because I, you know, I think um, uh, you know I've I've had a saying in my whole career that great marketing is about exclusion, right? So so if you think about what 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 the difference between good marketing and bad marketing is is bad marketing kind of goes after the whole world, right? Uh, you know because everyone's our customer, well everyone's not your customer, you know, and and Apple built an amazing brand by saying, hey, you know what, for most of the world, we're not for you, right? Actually making fun of the larger body of people who were, were not in, in order to hone in on who their customer was. You know, I think in the entrepreneurial space, it, it's the same way. You know, you see a lot of, there's a lot of me too. So we are, you know, we're the, we're the Airbnb of, um, I don't know, boxes or something, you know, whatever, you know, uh, so, so instead of buying boxes, you're going to rent boxes. Or I don't know. Um, I, I think, I think it's really focusing in on what is and what is solving a consumer need. I, I saw a great, great quote and I'll butcher it, but it was, you know, uh, build what the marketplace needs, not what you want to build. Right. And, and, and I thought it, it made a lot of sense because I've seen a lot of companies that have a fantastic mousetrap, except that there are no mice in the building that they're building it for, you know? So, 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 you know, you, you really got to build something, you know, no matter how elegant your solution is, there has to be a need for it in the marketplace. And, you know, so you, you, you can see marketplaces that are disrupting, you know, there's still, um, uh, uh, 19, 18, 19 percent of, of brand budgets are still spent in print. Um, they're spent in print not because consumers are spending their time there. Consumers only spend about four percent of their time in print, but that delta represents the gap between what marketers value in terms of digital or other alternatives to print and the ease to use and belief in, in the efficacy of print. So that that gap is, is a huge delta that despite all these amazing marketing things we have from the digital space hasn't you know ha, ha, is been really slow to change and and going to be disrupted you know it's it's just not going to not going to exist wow wow incredible thoughts but there's a lot that there's a lot there a lot of arbitrage in the market to to be taken over but uh, John we're going to wrap it up here I appreciate it so much thank you so much for taking your time to come out and join us on our first show again I'm Chris Gonzalez I'm your host with Something Social and this is John Andrews thanks everyone for joining us